Miles, see you in. All right, well, we he's, luckily we have Phil Brown, also bird expert. So we're gonna go ahead tonight um, and here we go. These are Ask a Naturalist this evening. We have a whole bunch of questions that people sent in. And this first one, I think it was from Phil Brown. Phil, why don't you tell us about this? Sure. Tell us what you found. Yeah, so, um, so this past fall, uh, I got a trail camera for the first time. They're a lot of fun if you're not familiar with them. They take um, nighttime and daytime pictures, but they're motion censored. So they have um, the ability to, uh, to photograph at night and, and capture um, some, you know, some color and shapes and, and objects of things going bump in the night. So, um, so I've been doing a lot of tracking this winter and moving the camera around a lot and I ended up following tracks to a den site uh, close to my house and I wondered what was in there. I had an idea based on the tracks, but I didn't think I'd find two different species of animals sharing the den within five seconds of each other. So that's what happened the first night I set it up. It was porcupine and uh, and raccoon and then solidly porcupine from that point onward. So um, I'll take this question. I did forget to mention that my area uh, that I love is mammals and so I actually was researching this question before Phil even sent it in because I had gone out with my friend Eric Aldrich who runs the Hancock um, Wildlife Cam and we had found some pictures of Bobcat sharing a den with a porcupine and I said is this common and he said it's not the first time that he's gotten this image of a porcupine in a den with a Bobcat um, just kind of at the same time, ignoring one another. So I had been doing some research and what I found out is that um, porcupines are pretty, they are pretty much go to the same den. They're kind of have a fidelity to a specific den. And oftentimes other animals um, are curious about dens and they'll check them out. And you can see this if you've tracked before to a den, a lot of times you'll find it marked with urine or feces like that. Um, and they'll sometimes go in. And just because they go into the same den doesn't mean they're actually in the same chamber. So sometimes the den can go down and then there's different chambers off the den or different areas. But in this case, um, from Phil's picture, you can see they're kind of right in the same area. Um, <clears throat> and that, that's not very uncommon actually that uh, animals might key in on a porcupine finding a really good spot because porcupine dens are dry, um, they're out of the elements and perhaps other animals recognize this. Oh, the porcupine's got the best real estate. So they might use the same den as a porcupine um, and not really interfere interact with each other. And it's actually not even uncommon for more than one porcupine to be in the same den. I should, let me just qualify that when I say it's not common or it is common. It's, it happens, but it's not, doesn't happen often. So according to the porcupine expert, Oldest Rose, who wrote the answer and question book on porcupines, he says that he's done a lot of research on this, 12% of porcupines will share a den with another porcupine. Usually a male, feel, male and female will match up and it's the male whose territory overlaps the female. As for interspecies um, den sharing, it might also have to do with just body warmth and it's raccoons aren't as loyal to a den. So they're checking out a den, they might be hanging out, they might be exploring and they're gonna move on. And the fact that they weren't there at the same time as your porcupine means they might've just been curious and checking it out. But there are video footages of porcupines sharing dens with things like bobcat and sleeping in the same den as raccoons. So sometimes it happens, I guess, and it should, maybe shouldn't surprise us. Um, in fact, kind of who's going to mess that much with a porcupine. This is also something that happens with skunks, a similar thing. So maybe if you have built-in defenses like quills or a stinky odor, um, other animals just kind of come in your space and they don't really mess with you and they share your warmth and your dry den and then they those animals typically move on, whereas the porcupine will return back to the den. So Phil, how was that? Did that answer oh, your wow. question? Yeah, fantastic. Great to hear that. Yeah. Uh, that so was... 
that was really our only cozy kind of romantic question in our Valentine's edition. <laughs> we have, that to... Susie, we have a question uh, about oh, this den sure. of what it might look like from the outside and where it would be located. Such a great question. Well, Phil, you you actually saw the den. Do you want to tell us what type of where did you find it and what it looked yep. like? Sure. Well, much like you said, uh, it's in a good high dry spot. It was perched up at the edge of a field clearing uh, in a brush pile uh, that was created by an old um, forestry operation. So it was a big brushy mound kind of overflowing down to a wet area. So it was perched up above and facing the, the south and western sun. Perfect. So it's a good spot for the animal to hang out too. Yeah, typically this time of the year, porcupines are denned up in New Hampshire, in particular the Granite State. You'll find them in um, kind of the granite overhangs, the rocky kind of crevices. Um, that's really good porcupine habitat in the winter, and they're usually located near uh, hemlock trees. That's primarily what they're eating during the winter time, climbing up the hemlocks and eating the inner bark of the hemlock tree. In the summertime, they change their um, habitat. Their den moves typically more towards the edge of a meadow, um, and and they're less um, loyal to a particular den at that time of the year. They'll use different dens, and they just want to be near that fresh green grass that they can eat. So good, great question, great follow up. And thanks, Phil. All right, let's see what our next question is this evening. Oh, wow, this is such a good picture. I saw these two mushrooms in the woods in Pella, Massachusetts on January 17th. I was surprised to see fresh mushrooms in winter since it has been cold, though not always freezing, temperatures up over 40 degrees Fahrenheit over the past week. Could you talk about how they can be active during cold temperatures and how active are they below 32 degrees? Thanks, from Carl. So this is for the mushroom man. John Benjamin, and clearly Carl would really love to take your winter fungi class, John. Tell us what we're seeing and what is the deal with mushrooms in the winter? All right, so we've got two different mushroom species. Uh, one is uh, one that is not unusual to see this time of year and one is definitely unusual for a number of reasons. So I'll talk about the, the top mushroom first and then the bottom one, and then a little bit about that, that final question about the activity and growth of mushrooms uh, in winter. So um, what we have on the, the top part of the screen there is a mushroom called the late fall oyster. And uh, oysters are kind of a famous variety of mushrooms. There's some different species. They are notable uh, for being edible. There's a more uh, palatable oyster species, the more common oyster uh, that tends to grow, you know, different times of year. Um, but it, you know, definitely more commonly in the fall and the late summer. And the late fall oyster is notable for being much more common, you know, in October and November, but they will persist into late winter. So we see some older specimens here. And an important thing to recognize about mushrooms is just how much their color and appearance can change depending on how old they are. So these are some kind of withered older specimens of late fall oyster that are starting to turn kind of brown. And when they're younger, they have a really distinctive kind of olive green color on the cap and some really nice yellow uh, gills underneath. And uh, one way to tell their oysters very distinctively is the way the gills kind of all branch out from the little stalk that attaches to the tree. These are decomposer mushrooms or saprobes. You'll find them on you know, uh, dead logs of all kinds of different hardwoods and sometimes on conifers too. But it's a very common mushroom and one of the ones you'll expect to find uh, you know, even into this time of the winter. So that's, that's one that I was like, okay, yeah, that, that's, uh, common winter mushroom that uh, is not too strange. The one on the bottom, I was really surprised to hear you found that this time of year. And this is just a super weird mushroom. Uh, so the common name for this one is the uh, stocked puffball in aspic. And I don't know if you know what aspic is. I, I, when I, when I originally read about this, I had to look it up, but it's a sort of gelatinous uh, meat uh, jello. <laughs> so I guess what it is. And uh, so this mushroom, it's covered in this translucent goo that kind of looks like amphibian eggs, actually. It has these little red specks inside of this goo, and it grows into the stalk, and the goo kind of sloughs off of the mushroom as it grows and leaves this little pile of little translucent globs on the bottom. And it kind of has this puffball-like appearance on the, the end of the fruiting body there. 
And eventually, you know, it starts out, it's bright red. This is an older specimen here. It started to fade out. And it has a strange little cap on the top where the spores will emerge, this kind of little red cap. And uh, so number one, it's just very, uh, and a weird looking mushroom in general. And uh, normally, you know, you won't find these this time of year. So the fact that you found one fruiting uh, in January is pretty interesting. I, I, whenever I found these, it's been usually in, you know, June or July in, in the summer, but I, they are known to be uh, one that will appear into the, in the spring. So, you know, not entirely bizarre, um, but, you know, it does exemplify a little bit about the variability of fruiting of mushrooms uh, that can take advantage of uh, changes in weather. They don't have the same kind of, you know, um, response to sunlight uh, levels like plants do when they have different stages of their life cycle. So the whole idea that we can have these warm, uh, you know, periods of winter that are unusual and that's going to be happening more and more with climate change, like there are going to be mushrooms that are going to take advantage of that and are going to appear more and more often in unusual times of year when they just have the right uh, temperature and moisture conditions to result in the, uh, the fruiting bodies growing. Um, and this mushroom, by the way, is not a puffball, just to mention that the taxonomy of it has been one that's been debated for years and years, and they actually have decided it's most closely related to boletes, which are the sponge mushrooms, though it looks nothing like a bolete whatsoever. Uh, so it's kind of its own weird offshoot of that lineage, uh, anybody who's interested. <laughs> um, but in general, the whole question about, you know, activity of fungus in winter, uh, when it's below freezing, you're probably not going to have much growth or even much metabolism in the mycelium. I mean, that's going to, you know, once it, it's below freezing and you have ice crystals, that's going to bring the activity to a halt. Uh, but there are certainly a number of mushrooms that will fruit in the winter. And when you have these little warm spells, that's definitely when you can have these, uh, you know, crops of winter mushrooms and sometimes even unusual species like this one we see here, the uh, stalked puffball in aspic. Oh, all right, John, is the stalked puffball in aspic, I just had to say it, but is that oh, edible? Ask, Susie. I know, uh, is that edible? No, it is not edible okay. to the best of my knowledge. And honestly, anybody who would want to eat something that looks like that, I would be questioning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the, um, the um, late oyster mushroom. Yes, the late it. oyster mushroom, uh, when it's fresh and when you cook it, it is edible. Uh, with the caveat that uh, please be incredibly knowledgeable and cautious with all mushroom foraging. Uh, and this is one that, yeah, when, when you cook it up when it's fresh, it's a little bit tougher than the other common oysters that are a little bit more tender and a little bit tastier in my opinion. But uh, it's certainly an edible species. And when you can get it when it's younger and fresher and cook it up, it's not bad in soups, I've found. Wow, thanks, John. That was really fascinating. And thanks, Carl, for sending in these finds. What a find that uh, stocked puffball in aspic is. Wow. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, this is kind of gory. So I uh, just giving a viewer advisory here. We have uh, here, here are photos of a blood spattered deer track. I backtracked over 150 yards to the road thinking the deer might have been hit by a car, but that proved incorrect as the lesser traces of blood occurred on the opposite side of the road as well. Continued backtracking showed more insignificant blood spots had to quit the investigation due to posted land. I looked up information about estrus in does, and just in case you're not sure what that means, that means if they are in heat, which I hope to be the cause, but found nothing suggesting such bleeding. In fact, I read that deer have covert bleeding in which all is reabsorbed into the body. That is true, as a matter of fact. They, do, they don't shed their blood, it just goes gets recycled. Just beyond the original spot shown in the photo, I found three deer beds with 10 yards of, uh, within 10 yards of each other. Maybe two different deer beds, but thinking one individual, considering the freshness of tracks, all three showed orange tinted snow and showed more blood spots. Forward tracking beyond the beds the next day, I saw no more evidence of blood. Your thoughts, many thanks. So this fell into my wheelhouse as the mammals person. And I spent a lot of time like a CSI investigator looking at this. And finally, I had to call my expert Mead Kedo, who couldn't be here tonight, though I begged him because I thought he would give a better answer than I will. But basically Mead and I spent quite a bit of time talking about this. And what we think is that the deer had an injured foot or an injur injury on its body, and that was leaving the blood. And we thought could have been due to predation, could have been like a nip or a nick or something like that from an animal that, or animals that were trying to eat it, could be from um, barbed wire, 
which can happen. There's lots of barbed wire throughout our woods. Could be from um, hard ice. It's not uncommon for, um, for an animal if there was really hard ice and it, it just punctured or scraped itself. So we think it was from an injury. And that injury um, was causing the steer to leave a trail of blood. And in terms of the bedding, um, it was probably made by one deer, this one deer in particular. So normally at this time of the year, the females are kind of in fam family groups. So the um, does and fawns from the female fawns from the year before are together kind of in a herd. And the, the male deers are either in uh, singular or in bachelor groups. Um, of only two to five, whereas the females will be a bigger herd. If the snow's really deep, they could be um, herded up in a deer yard, but um, that orange tinge in the snow is from urine um, and not so much blood. Their urine can be that orange tingy color. And you can really see here the two different colors. There's the red, um, the red blood, and then there's some orange tingy thing. Follow up with deer and grant, well, uh, yeah. Wow, um, I just read that chat, but I, I can't think about it right now because I just have to finish what I'm saying. It is possible that this deer um, kind of got left behind from a herd um, and maybe it is a female that, you know, just couldn't keep up with the males, with the other females. It could be a singular male. Um, and um, one thing too is that um, it's not uncommon for deer to leave more than one bed. So they'll lay down in a bed and then move no, throughout I... their sleeping, lie in their bed, move through their sleeping, uh, get up and, and um, set down again. And part of the science behind that is that it kind of keeps predators um, from just keying in on one spot and also helps them keep off of um, parasites on their bodies. So, and so Kelly is suggesting that the healing is happening. It's still moving the beds, it's moving around. It doesn't seem to have problem moving. It's, it's on its way. So any other questions in the chat or comments? Thank you for that. That was pretty exciting. And, um, and I hope that answered your question and we hope the deer got better. When do male deers drop their antlers? Male deer have dropped their antlers in December um, and that wouldn't necessarily have that much blood related to it. Um, and I should mention that um, female deer are in heat in fall and early um, winter and not right now. So um, it wouldn't have been, it's the wrong season for them. All right. Here's our next question. This looks so sweet, two trees together. I found this unique white pine in Dublin. Is it one tree or two? How does this happen of trees formed together like this? Both trunks were comparable in size, but the right-hand one was dead. This is from Brett. And even though this looks very sweet, I think Jeremy has a dark answer about this. Jeremy, what's the story? Is he there? Uh oh. <laughs> I, I just had to unmute. Sorry. Oh my uh, God. I don't know that I have anything dark about this. It's uh, it, it it is interesting. You know, this was supposed to be our our Valentine's Day special, and Karen Siever and I were out in the woods this summer, um, inventorying snags, and we found it wasn't it wasn't a white pine. It was a maple like this that had. A, a similar feature where the, the trunks combined at one point through a branch. And, uh, but it was really shaped like a heart. And I wish I had a picture of that because it would, it would have been, it would have been good uh, before this. So the first question here is, are these, are these two different trees or is this one, one tree? And I can't really answer that question. It's sort of buried in the snow there. It certainly looks like it's the same tree and that, that early on in this tree's life, there was some kind of injury to the, what I would call the terminal leader, which would be the central leader in the top. And a couple of lateral branches took over at that point. So you can imagine that the tree trunk dividing at, at that point. And then in essence, two sides of the tree growing, growing from, from that, from that uh, on. And then the, the second part of, that's weird about this tree is this connection a little further up, just above the hole there. Um, and what that is, is that's actually a, a, a branch. 
Um, it looks like it's a branch from the tree on the right that went right alongside the, the, the uh, stem on the left and actually at some point grafted onto the, the tree stem on the left. Um, trees of similar species can do this um, in terms of grafting, that is to say that their, their, their tissue on the, uh, will, will actually combine and, and sort of fuse with, with the other tree there. So this is um, a situation where the, the proximity of that branch touching the trunk of, of that stem on the left uh, just resulted in a graft where the where the two sort of uh, combined and then grew from there and sort of hid that that grafting scar. Um, a couple of interesting things have happened here. Um, the you notice how big that branch is. So when it was a branch, it obviously started as a small branch and then grew through time. Um, but it's hard to imagine that that branch really stuck out and was getting much sunlight. And branches are uh, autonomous. That is to say that. If a branch is no longer producing enough photosynthate from the, the foliage that it has available, the branch, the tree, the tree loses the branch. It doesn't, branches don't stick around if the tree is having to, to provide nutrients for them. So that branch, even though it, it probably didn't have foliage for very long after the, the grafting uh, got established, was probably acting as a parasite on the tree to the left. That is to say, it was pulling nutrients from the tree to the left to keep it alive, and that's why it grew so much. Because you can see that none of the branch scars on the, the right-hand side tree are nearly as big as, as, as that branch was. So what kept that branch alive was actually stealing nutrients from the, from the tree on the left through the grafting that had occurred. Um, anyway, it's, it's fascinating to see. It, 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 it's, it's not super uncommon. You do see these things um, quite a bit, and you know you you even see situations where um, people have interfered and grafted different species on on types. And so you can get I've seen uh, red pine tops on white pine root systems. So you can you can graft within the context of similar species, but you, you can't go too far. Susie, you know about grafting in the orchard world. I do, I do. Well, you could make a Frankenstein tree, huh? And it, it is a little dark, Jeremy. I mean, you're basically saying that this tree like like subsumed its its like neighbor. Well, it it took advantage of its neighbor. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a nice way to say it. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's good. I know we all know people like that. I mean, trees like that. Okay, here's a poll for everybody. We have a mystery here, and your job is going to be to try to identify what made these marks. It's running back and forth is our number one choice for these little divots in the snow, and followed by pine cone and then squirrels and ballet slippers. I would love to see squirrels and ballet slippers. Um, that would be really exciting. That would bring a whole new theme to the Nutcracker. <laughs> <laughs> Cracked myself up on that one. All right, um, this is very interesting. So we actually have the culprit of what made this. We have we have a picture of it. This is actually so something made on Facebook. This is actually made by a pine cone. Um, pine cone blowing across the snow will leave this trail. And it, it can look a lot like mice tracks or more, um, more like shrew or vole tracks, but it is actually pine cone. And you can tell because it's more than, um, it's more than two tracks or multiple tracks. It's kind of lying in a diagonal line and if you look you can often find the pine cone that left that track so that is good we're getting some snow tonight on top of some of that icy crust that we have this will be good practice all right let's see what our next mystery is ah what made these under the snow from francie um this is actually a really great question on a follow-up from the pine cone question um, you often see this type of trail um, as winter begins to fade and snow melts, it'll look like um, there has been some sort of crazy um, etch-a-sketch artist under the snow or a spirograph leaving this trail or these tunnels. And these are actually made by voles. What we're seeing here is a vole runway. So voles are like mice. You might think of them as meadow voles or 
um, red back voles. They're not quite like, um, like mice, they're their own thing. Um, and they live under the snow in the subnivian zone, that means under the snow, they make a little grassy nest. And usually during the rest of the year, they're very territorial. They don't get along. They, they will actually like have aggressive behavior towards one another. But in the winter, winter cold weather makes strange bedfellows, I guess you could say. Um, they um, change their social behavior and they kind of congregate together in nests under the snow. And then they have these runways where they're feeding on the grasses and the inner bark of trees. And if you have a garden, um, you might see this in your garden. If you have any um, little saplings that you're trying to grow, they'll be eating the inner bark of your saplings. And you can see the, all the evidence as the snow melts. Um, and what they're doing is they're kind of running back and forth on their um, alleyways or these runways back into their grassy nest. And even occasionally they're changing nests. So they're moving from one nest to another and that's thought to help keep pred predators away. Um, if you have a whole bunch of voles in one spot, that's an easy target for a fox. Um, but if you keep changing where you live, then the fox has to keep searching for you. So those are made by voles. Are there any questions, Miles? Oh yeah, Phil, Phil Brown is reminding me that Mead would say, don't blame the moles for the roles of the voles. And actually that's perfect timing because our next picture is um, this questionable thing. This is our yard is crisscrossed with these paths. And before this morning snow, we were finding mounds of earth in the lawn. The obvious answer is moles, but which variety and how does such small creatures generate such wide tracks and huge piles of earth. Jim and Kathy from Fitzwilliam. And Jim and Kathy, you, you've you got some of the answer right, but those tunnels, those tracks are made by voles with a V. The mounds of earth, and I think we have a really good picture of the mounds of earth in the next slide, is made by moles. So moles are different than voles and they eat different things. The moles are insectivores, they're eating insects. And people wanna blame moles um, about eating their bulbs, but really you've got to blame the voles with the V, not the moles with the M. Moles are busy eating all of the insects um, and voles are eating the inner bark and your bulbs and lots of other things. Um, and moles make that huge pile of dirt um, because they're excavating. They don't live under the snow, they live under the ground. And at this time of the year, they're under the ground under the frost line. And to get under the frost ground line, they've got to have good tunnels and they have to move a lot of dirt. And they have a really unique way of doing this or completely adapted to doing it. Um, they have huge front paws that are used for digging. They look like baseball mitts and they'll dig and dig and dig. And then they're actually able to flip around that pile of dirt and then they use, so they, they dig and dig and dig and then they kind of climb over it and then they get on the other side and with their giant paws, they push it out so that they're actually excavating um, their tunnel and removing the dirt. And you can find quite a big pile of dirt from a mole. We have two types of moles here in New Hampshire. We have the um, star nose mole, my favorite mole. And then we have the hairy tailed mole. If you want to hear more about voles, moles, and the other tiny little mammal shrews, you can come hear me talk um, through Zoom on April 8th for the um, Chesterfield Conservation Commission and Friends of the Chesterfield Library, where I'll be talking about voles, moles, and shrews, especially the venomous shrew. So um, you can check that out on our website. It's not up yet, but it will be up soon. So kept, keep checking. We do have a question, Susie. Sure. We have some gardeners out there and Gloria, Gloria is wondering how to discourage voles and moles in the garden. Well, you might not want to necessarily discourage moles in your garden because moles might eat the pests, the insect pests that you might not like, like grubs. Um, and um, voles, it's a good question. How do you discourage them? It's really not a good answer. Um, I wouldn't take to killing any voles on purpose, personally. They're such a great um, keystone food for our middle predators like foxes and um, fisher and um, things that we want to be encouraging. And plus they're, they're voles, they gotta make a living. 
One thing that you could do is if you have saplings um, that you're really looking to grow, like when I lived at an orchard, we did put predator guards around them uh, on um, sapling guards. So we would put a tube around it. Um, you can do that. You can sink it down around your bulbs um, and put a guard around it, but you really have to get it down low. Um, and I guess what I would say is maybe just know that you're going to have some voles. And that's right. Hashtag voles matter too. I love it. Rosemary, I'm with you. Um, you know, we live in a place we 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 plant a little, the voles eat it, plant a little more and, and some of it grows. So I don't really have a good answer for that because I'm okay with voles and moles in my garden and foxes in my yard and fishers at my compost pile. That's so. a great answer. All right, let's move on. That's enough of me yammering away about voles, moles, and shrews. What's next, Miles? Turn the oh, tables. turn the tables. This is so exciting. We have a question for you. Now, this is here's the rules. Um, we are going to put up a question. The first person to answer the question correctly using the chat will win themselves an incredible Harris Center hat that has our logo on it. Um, and we're going to ask Brett and Phil Brown. Yeah, you guys are going to be the judges of the correct answer. Miles, did I miss anything in my directions? No. Uh, okay. Well, the prize. The prize. I did. I mentioned the hat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. Here we go. Awesome Here we go. hat. Here we go. Here it goes. Drum roll. What plants do these come from? From Phil. All right. Here's the picture. These are from this plant. You need to identify the plant that they come from. Wow. All right. And how about Phil and Brett? Do we have a winner? You got to ask Phil because there's some specifics here that I actually, I don't know that level of specificity. So I bet Phil does though, or Jeremy. Um, yeah, I, I do see the first answer that came through that I believe is correct. It's from Lori and followed by several other correct Guesses for speckled alder, Lori Williams. Lori Williams. The first one to have chimed in here. That's great. Lori Williams, if you can chat privately to Ma uh, Miles using the chat button, your address, um, we will mail you a hat. And way to go. Yeah, thumbs up. Phil Brown, tell us a little bit about the speckled alder. Sure. Um, well, it's a shrub, it's a wetland shrub, and it has both male and female. Um, parts on the same tree, on the same branch. Uh, so you're seeing uh, male flowering body on, on the bottom, the catkins. They're called catkins. Uh, they grow in little groups of, I think, four to six generally. Um, and the female cones are, are also uh, containing the, uh, the female flower up top there. Uh, they grow in little clusters also. They look like miniature pine cones. They're really tiny. So um, it's a very common wetland shrub in this part of the world. And um, these shrubs have multiple stems and they grow in little wet drainage ditches and they're an important food source for a lot of critters and good habitat. Thank you, that was great. And congratulations to Lori and to everybody else who is um, participating and guessing tonight. That's awesome. All right, let's move on. What's our next question tonight? Oh man, I'm really on the hot seat tonight. This is a big question. Okay, I want everybody to look at that picture and I'll read what happened here. See the skeleton up in the tree? I'm no naturalist, but I think it belonged to a deer. It really creeped me out when I stumbled upon it. So I apologize for the bad photos, but I wasn't getting any closer. This was in Bolton, Massachusetts this past spring. Did a non-human animal do it? And if so, what kind? Wow. So yes, um, we have a close up of this picture. So Miles, if we want to get in that close up, do we have a close up? Thought we did. Yep, we have a close up. So it is indeed a deer skeleton that's up in the tree. And this picture, I have a true confession. We've had this, this question for a while from Kim, but we haven't put it up because it could be a little controversial. So if you've been kind of paying attention to mammals, and you came across a carcass up in a tree, you are probably thinking of a cat, 
an animal in the cat family. And you might even be thinking of something like a mountain lion, um, but you could also be thinking of something like a bobcat. So I had to do a little bit of research for this. And I talked with Mead Cado, who I always go to for my mammal questions. He's the fellow who taught me my mammals course at graduate school. And, and he um, suggests that this is indeed from a bobcat kill, most likely. Um, actually, I should go back. He doesn't think it might be from the kill. What he says is it's not the complete skeleton. And a large male bobcat would be capable of bringing up the vertebra, and that's what we're seeing, the vertebra and the ribs of a deer and stashing it, caching it in the tree. And that's so that they have exclusive access to it from any other ground predators like coyotes or scavengers. Um, so hanging out in the tree gives them more access to it than and keeps it away from the coyotes. And he says that this might have been done after the deer's carcass had already been kind of eaten and cleaned up of some of its other parts like its legs or a whole stomach. And it kind of dragged the partially eaten part up, up into the tree. So um, some people might be thinking, well, could it be a mountain lion? And I'm going to take the party line here and say that in this case, it would be highly unlikely. Um, could it be? Maybe. But it most likely is the simplest answer, um, Occam's razor, which is a bobcat. We have lots and lots and lots of bobcats in our New England woods nowadays. Um, and we have sightings of mountain lions and very few confirmed by the scientists and the researchers. So I'm going with Mead Keto's answer, Bobcat. He did suggest it could also have been dragged up the tree by a large male fisher. And they've also been known to cache things in the tree. So any questions about that? Yeah, one, one follow-up question. Would there be any reason you see deer legs in a tree? Same thing, caching. Um, you might even see a deer leg cached um, in a tree for you know coming back later. Um, it probably it's not put there by a hunter most likely. You know the hunters are going to be gutting and cleaning their deer and then they leave pieces most likely the legs which they take off, and then um, a lot of times they if it was hunted by a hunter they'll carry the carcass out but they're going to leave oftentimes things like legs and things that they don't need. Um, and so when the legs get left behind, they get they can get scavenged by something like, uh, like bobcats, um, fisher, things like that. And so, yeah, there, there are sightings. I, I just wanna go back to the mountain lion part. The people do have sightings of mountain lions in this area. Um, and again, um, you know, there have been some documented um, cats, mountain lions, um, found um, documents, documented sightings, but there hasn't been any conclusive evidence that we have um, a breeding population of mountain lions here. All right, that's enough of that and on to this. This is a poll question. There's a, a mess on the ground. And the question is, what caused the mess at the base of this ash tree? You can look at the bark also, and then the base of the tree, and then they saw it in Lennox Mass. Here's the pole, not damaged, it's molting pileated woodpecker, bear marking, the big bad EAB, that's the emerald ash borer, or human boredom, maybe by bored teenagers who are stuck doing remote learning. What our results are? Sure. The number one answer was pileated woodpecker, followed by bear marking, and then the big bad EAB, the emerald ash borer. So, so we'll turn... That's what our yeah. audience thinks. That's great. Let's, let's ask Jeremy. Ask Jeremy. We should be we, ask, we should be asking Phil this question. He's an expert in this. It's, uh, I actually think that's a trick question. The the, the way the poll was done. Because Phil, what kind of woodpecker do you actually think caused that damage? Yeah, it's it is a trick question for sure. Um, yeah, the woodpecker uh, likely woodpeckers did the bark flecking, but they were after emerald ash borer, which is a uh, I'll let you take it away on that, Jeremy. 
which is just a, well, it so is a question. Last four is, uh, you've probably heard about it in the news. It's an in, invasive species. It was brought over from Asia. Boy, Phil, is it 20 years ago or something? Um, yeah, 1990s in Detroit, I think. Yeah, so upper Midwest, and it's made its way slowly uh, across the country, across the broad belt of broadleaf or, or the ash belt uh, of, of the US. It's come slowly because uh, um, it doesn't move much in a year. It doesn't fly very much. Um, and it, it's really decimating ash um, species of all kinds across the region. Uh, it, it, it's a, uh, it, an insect that oviposits its eggs under the bark of the tree, usually high up in the tree, and then they, it works down over time. And then the larvae of that insect um, eat the, 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 the phloem, the, the uh, tissue uh, just below the bark, and create these dramatic galleries under, uh, underneath the tree that really disrupts the tree's ability to provide water and nutrients to the, the leaves in the spring. So eventually this will, this will kill the ash trees. And the, the woodpeckers are making the mess because they know the, the insects, the larvae are in there and they're, they're seeking food. So and I, would I, add, I would add, it's probably not pileated woodpecker, although I think they will also feed on the bark. Uh, it seems like the most likely culprits from earlier studies were hairy woodpecker, downy woodpecker, and even white-breasted nuthatches feeding on bark in that manner to pull out the little larva um, just, just under the bark in these tiny little holes um, that are D-shaped holes is what you may be able to see a few in there. Yeah. Fascinating. It's, it's often hard to see what shape the hole is once the woodpeckers have come along because they're they're sort of in, in, enlarging those holes. Um, so this is a species that arrived in New Hampshire five years ago, uh, sort of north of Concord, and uh, I think has been in Hancock for the last two years. Is that right, Phil? A year and a half, maybe. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, so you'll see this. You'll see this uh, throughout Massachusetts, and you'll see it in New Hampshire now. Um, it's kind of what's called blonding of the ash tree bark, where the the woodpeckers have really sort of in their excavations have ripped off some of the outer bark and 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 and, sh and are exposing some of the inner bark which has a sort of blonder a lighter color a light brown color to it wow, wow. so it's it's I, it's not a fun st forest story because it's a very sad forest story in the sense that all species of ash are are in the in the US are susceptible all native species of ash in the US are susceptible and we haven't had a lot of, of luck with any kinds of control um, in terms of trying to keep it out of regions or in terms of biological controls. And there have been a couple of biological controls. So uh, insects brought in that would be predators for this species, but um, we'll have to see how it plays out. It, it, it uh, impacts ash that are over six inches. And so ash will continue to survive as young saplings. It's just they won't grow into mature trees and we're going to lose a lot of specimen trees uh, in wow. the near future. You, you can treat the trees with, a, with an insecticide. It's very expensive and it has to be done regularly so that it's not something that you can do in the forest. It's way too expensive for that kind of process. Thank you, Jeremy. And Phil, that was a little bit of a trick question. We like to keep it tricky here at uh, Ask a Naturalist, I guess. <laughs> All right, let's see if we have a happier something to look at, maybe. Here we go. What's next, Miles? How about some scat? The blonding. <laughs> oh, love it. Oh my gosh, I've been waiting for this question all night. First of all, I gotta give a shout out to Bob who sent this in because Bob's been coming to lots of Ask a Naturalist and um, his daughter, um, Erica, runs the Post and Beam um, brewery, which is in Peterborough and has been a co-sponsor of Ask a Naturalist in the past. I am wearing the sweatshirt today. And he sent in, this is his first question he sent in. He spotted these on a trail along a small river in Connecticut, more of a reddish brown than the picture shows. Any thoughts as to what they might be? I do have a thought on this. This is some good poop. Um, and I just got to move my little picture here to look at a little more. Um, this is some, you can see Bob's foot in the picture. So you can kind of get a sense of the scale of the scat. And you can see it's sort of blunted um, and kind of irregular 
in parts. And in a way, it looks a little bit like maybe it's got apple pieces in it um, or acorn pieces in it. It's made up of kind of a fruity, something fruity. It's a fruity tootie. <laughs> ah, fruity tootie poop. Um, and I, I think that this could be um, possibly a raccoon scat. Um, but it's kind of big. So I had to look at it again and look at it again. And it's got a little twist. And, and I'm thinking that that little twist is reminding more of a canine. And this is where a scat can be a little funny or interesting. Because at first I see it's sort of blunted. Um, it's made up of kind of some fruity stuff. Um, so I think it's near a river, I'm thinking raccoon. But now I'm thinking that I think it's coyote having had some um, apple. And I think I see the apple skins in there pretty good. Um, yeah, Miles is pointing to it with a pointer. So Bob, I think you had some coyote scat right here, which is exciting. Um, yeah. So, all right, we got to keep moving along. And this might be our very last one. We have five minutes. Let's see. We got any more, Miles? Oh, this is another. This is the big mystery right here. Okay, this is fascinating. Phil, get ready. Check this out. I see primary wing feathers around a noose of tracks, trowels with alternate prints. I don't really know whose track it is. Same area of field where I saw another such encounter last month, not too far to a large tree and some lilacs from Anne. And she did put her ski pole in it. And um, we got a good picture of this. So Miles, let's flip to the next one so we can really look at it. Okay, I'm gonna ask Phil to to fill us in on that track that we're seeing, that feathery track. Okay, well, really neat photo for starters. Um, yeah, obviously there are some feather prints in the snow, so we know this is in the avian world. Um, there are also some heavier, deeper footprints, some trails that seem to, to go through it or around it. Um, so yeah, what, what are those exactly? That, that's a little harder to tell. If they are the same thing, it's a little bit easier um, to, to tell because this is a, a very wide trail for a bird. How many types of birds are, are really walking through the snow right now that are, that are big and deep and heavy that would leave that kind of an imprint? There, there's really just one that I could think of that would leave that kind of a trail. Uh, and I bet a few of you could guess it. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I would postulate that this would be a turkey walking through the snow, wild turkey. Um, the wing prints are, are large enough where you can see where the wing and the long tail with those long tail feathers off to the right um, can hit. Can you see that the right photo? Yeah, that one. It shows that round kind of wedge shaped tail. And, and maybe the, some of the primary feathers and secondaries leading up in that direction, but it doesn't really face the trail. So it, it does make you kind of think that maybe whatever this animal was, was going after what was walking. So that's, that's another thought here. So I, I guess that would be my thought that, that this is turkey tracks, but I could be wrong. Um, but curious to hear if others have thoughts. I spent some time looking at this too. And so I noticed that the trail looks a lot like a bird trail to me, as opposed to a mammal trail. It's like two together, kind of draggy, um, like a walking trail. It, it doesn't have characteristic markings of something like um, other walkers that you would see. Um, and they're side by side a little bit, which is really interesting. So I thought it was a, I thought it was bird. Um, I thought turkey. I wondered about owl, and I know other people have. So can you talk a little bit about what might be different with an owl's print? Yeah, I don't think you'd see as much of a tail projection on an owl. That's that's pretty much the giveaway for me that this would be turkey, other than the tracks itself. But the wing prints are are, are the, the tail feathers are so long. I happen to have a turkey feather right here. Um, turkey primary feathers can be as long as 15 or 16 inches. So this one's a little bit shorter, maybe 10 or 12. Um, but that classic patterning that you can't obviously see from, from the photo, but um, 
yeah, these, these feathers are big and heavy and they hit the snow pretty hard. Um, if you've ever flushed a turkey, scared it up from the snow, either accidentally or intentionally, hopefully not intentionally, um, you'll see how uh, you can hear them. They, they have such big, powerful wings. They make quite a racket. And it usually does take them a couple of flaps to get off of the snow, depending on the conditions. So this, this kind of looks like deep powdery snow that the turkey was walking through. And they too do tend to be very circuitous in their walking. As yeah. They're looking for seed heads and ferns and and anything they could find for food, scratching underneath with their with their big claws, exposing uh, seeds underneath the snow too. And I think Pam, she asked a really good question: Did these tracks happen simultaneously? Like, was it could it have been one set of tracks and then later on another? Because there's a set that goes through the wing print like the tail print. So it, turkeys don't usually travel alone, right? So right, there might have been, groups. Yep. there might have been more than one turkey in this area. And so what we're seeing are a couple of like two turkeys, one whose wings went out and not necessarily flew, but just maybe steadied itself. Hmm. Oh, maybe. So, right. Yeah, as opposed to flapping off to fly. Yeah, with, with any trail, it's it's um, obviously hard to capture in a photo, but as much as you can to follow that trail out and get to see the whole pattern of where it was. If you probably backtracked that turkey far enough, you might see where it actually landed in the snow coming out of its roost tree, but you might be walking in the woods all day if you did that. So <laughs> that's good. That's not all right. Bad. Yeah, I think that might be it. Let me check our time and say, yeah, we're just out 6.30. Um, and um, thank you. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you like this, you can join us again next month for our next Ask a Naturalist. Brett, I 